So today, the whole novel is Madame Bovary. So we got part two and part three in for today. So part three isn't as long as part two. So you know, part three kind of wraps up with on a very speedy pace. But what's to say about the book? Right? Emma does Emma cheats. Right? She she cheats a whole lot. A whole lot, right? She can't get enough of it. Um, she sort of also develops a very extravagant lifestyle, right? She goes beyond her means. So she thinks her family and all this debt and her husband doesn't know about it. Her husband's kind of throughout this whole rest of the book, her husband is poor guy, right? He, he's, he's just clueless. He loved, he loves her unconditionally. He trusts her unconditionally. Poor, the poor guy, right? But, um, but yeah, we have her affairs with both Leon and, and uh, Rodolph here, right? So we, that could be part of what we talk about today is just those two guys and what did she find intriguing about both of them. Um, but as we find out, the book has a really dark and awful ending, right? <laughs> you know, everyone dies and the kid goes to become a peasant working at the factory as a child worker when she's like 10. So, uh, yeah, very cynical ending to this book. This is not a happily ever after book. It ends tragically for everyone involved. So, um, yeah, Emma even kind of almost resorts to prostitution pretty close to the end. I mean, she does it, but she comes close. So, um, yeah, I'll just turn the floor over to you all then. I mean, uh, that's, a, that's pretty much a summary recap of a long part of the book. What did you all, just to continue our discussion from last week, what did you all think of this character? What did you think about how her arc progressed? Um, did you feel pity for her in any way? Um, or do you feel disgust towards her? Like what? What do you get? What are you guys feeling with Emma's character, especially character, especially? I kind of feel bad for her. I feel like that she isn't happy with her her marriage life, and I feel like that's kind of sad that she felt like that she needed to be with somebody else. Right. So she she's not comfortable. She wouldn't be comfortable in her old skin. Right, yeah, you know, she has to. She has to be with someone at all times. Regardless, I mean, regardless of how unhappy she is, leave before you cheat. It's not. There's just no excuse for it whatsoever. Right. I agree well, with you. Right. Well, the conundrum she finds herself in is she lives in very Catholic France, right? Like divorce is almost unheard of. So, um, right. yeah, she's stuck in a way. But is I understand that you know divorce is unheard of, but wouldn't it? You would think it would be more frowned upon to cheat on your spouse than it would be to leave. I don't know. I mean, maybe not, but I, you would just, you would think so. I, I felt so bad for uh, Charles. Is it Charles? Yeah. Is that his name? Her yeah. husband. I felt so bad for him as I like, when he, she pulls him into her, I, I don't know what you want to call it, De, delusion, grandeur of, of a of a of a, uh, a that lifestyle that she want that she wanted. And when he does that surgery and messes it up, and and like they're they're talking of 
the future they will have and and all that and I just I feel like that was all mm. her and her delusions wanting I don't even know if it's delusion but always wanting better always wanting more and I just I just felt so bad for him like I, he I, he he would probably be happy with his mundane life or whatever you know like he would have just been happy and then here he <laughs> that guy's leg or legs leg probably um, i think rots okay. off like so it's yeah but the baby like she just forgets about it and mm. yeah i mean but he's the one who sent it sent the baby to the the nurse house mother whatever He's because he didn't think that she could care for it at that time or whatever, but um, but he should have been more man enough to bring that baby home or whatever. I don't know. Yeah, I just he, she just pulled him completely into her and, and he would have done anything. And and all she could do is be like, ooh, uh Ru Rudolph, Randolph, whatever his name is. <laughs> like all she could do is think of of who else and what else that she could do, I guess. Literally. <laughs> but uh no, I uh, what was another part that I found? Oh, when it when the guy I, I'm pretty sure it's the Frenchman. You know how the Leon. One, I'm pretty sure the he sees her and he's like, ooh, she's like made a, um, she's got a body like a Parisian and uh, like that. I loved how that was described. Like I could just, I, I don't know, I could just smell the pheromones coming off of her because she had him like Pebby Le Pew like this. Yeah. She, yeah. <laughs> I loved how that was described. But yeah, he, he even gets sick of her crap after a while. Though. Yeah, that's pretty bad. When, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when somebody that, yeah, that you're just having an affair with gets sick of you, like it's, they don't have to put up with all your shit. So, <laughs> yeah, I, I think that was, I thought that was interesting too. But I'll let somebody else talk. <laughs> so, so far, the, the class is, mo besides Jenna, so far the class is mostly, uh, you know, almost, mostly definitely not on Emma's side as far as sympathizing with her here. Um, uh, I mean, I do to a certain point. I mean, I don't know if I if if i i know she brought it on herself and everything and i mean she goes to she that she she pays for it let's put it like that and i believe like she she knows she's paying for it at the end so like so i don't want to just say uh no i'm you know but i i do i, I my heart goes out because some people like that, she's struggling with something and like she just can't break free from it. So she's got to pretty much put herself in that fantasy of lust and why don't you love me? Don't you love me to all these men? And she's definitely got a mental illness. The whole time that I was that I read this, I was like this woman either how's about to get the dsm out and start going through her <laughs> her checklist of symptoms but i mean she's i don't know if it's an identity disorder i don't know if it's i, I don't know but she's definitely got a mental illness and she's 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 definitely manic at times like she's she's something else so <laughs> i do like I, that was what made me have pity for her i'm like you know it's all, and I've watched women like this personally in real life. <laughs> like it. it's, you, yeah, you hate what they do, but you're like, man, you know. I guess it's my work too. Like I, I don't know, but um, like that's the, 
the fixer in me, I guess. I don't know, but I, I did. I do feel I do feel empathy, sympathy, something for her. It's like seeing a train wreck. You know that it's going to happen and you know there's nothing you can do to stop it. And you're just kind of standing there watching it. And that's the way I felt reading the book. I could see her going down this path and I'm like, no, no, don't do it. Just stop. <laughs> but, you know, you have to let people make their own choices. And Timmy was talking something there a minute ago about people cheating. I've told my husband this, and this is just something good for you ladies to remember. If he don't love me and he says he don't love me and he wants to walk away, that's fine. We'll get a no-fault divorce. We'll go our separate ways. But if he makes me look like an idiot, I will take him to the cleaners. He won't have a pot to pee in or a window to throw it out of. <laughs> you know, I always said that. I'll be honest. I told my wife, I said, if you ever cheat on me, I'll kill you and whoever it is to cheat. But once it happened, I didn't care. So you just get the hell out of my house. Kick rocks. I'm Timmy, not worried about it. Yep. Timmy, we, we want to know how your date went last week. You, you got to keep got to keep us up. I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember. I just know that my uh, I was with a friend, and I was like, you know, what happened? He said. Dude, he said, we got to McDonald's and you just woke up and said, F, yeah. So, <laughs> so <laughs> it's all right. Good times. Just a, just another day. You had a better birthday than I did. <laughs> Mom would have been hard to talk. <laughs> Yeah, I was laughing for a good while after class last week about, about all that. <laughs> Sherry, you, to go back to your comment, um, I'm sure that you've seen even some of your like patients and stuff have a similar mindset to Emma, right? Absolutely. It's like they're all, it's almost kind of narcissistic. It's like, I can't, I'm with this person till the new wears off and then I move on to the next person. It's like they're always looking for the next best thing. And that's another thing that I felt about Emma, almost that she was narcissistic. Yeah, she, she's definitely pretty vain and full of herself here. Um, she 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 knows that she's got the good looks and things like that, right? So she's so she's she's very quick to sort of wrap these men around her finger, right? Like like Leon, who Nicole was talking about earlier, like Pepe Le Pew, right? She she manipulates, she does that this on purpose. Yeah, I kind of feel sorry for her, but I kind of don't. Like, I feel like she just lives in this romantic fantasy world. And she's always looking for a love that's never going to meet her standards. Because she lives in this fantasy world. Right. She wants to be the, she wants to be uh, Cinderella at the ball all the time, right? That, that seems to be how she wants to live her life. I mean, reality doesn't quite work that way. I agree with what she said. I, to add to my comment earlier, just to, to defend myself, I definitely do not agree with her cheating on, on her husband. Definitely think that's wrong. I do feel bad for her, like she said, because I feel like she feels tries to feel a void that she doesn't know where to get it from and that she's unhappy in her marriage. But either way, it's definitely wrong. Well, I'll, I'll ask you this, Jenna. Um, if Emma lived in a different time and place, like let's say she lived in a 
in America right now, right? Do you think that she would be able to fill that void without cheating? Uh, because maybe like women have more opportunities and can get divorced and things like that now. Do you think maybe she would stand a better chance if she lived in a different time and place? I think that maybe, especially about divorce, but I feel like she's trying to fill a void with a man and not really anything else. I think there's also something to say about people, like whenever you're just, I don't know, like, for example, like a preacher's daughter growing up, for whatever the case, they end up being so wild. It's like just because you shouldn't do it, you feel, I don't want to say obligated to do it, but you just like have more drive, more of an urge. Right. Yeah, yeah. that's a that's a cliche for a reason, right? The pre, the pre, wild preacher daughters. Right? Hey, yeah. Uh, yeah, stay after class. Okay, now I remember it. I was, it come back to me. I got something to tell you. <laughs> like um, seeing how far you can go, pushing your limits to to see how far it'll go till like it breaks. I see. I think because like I kept noticing that those those signs of the mental illness, like divorce, she would have probably definitely been divorced in today's time. But I still feel like the 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 mental illness would have done her done her in like she might have been able to get on medicine and all that and have somewhat of a somewhat of a normal life but I don't know that I just don't think that she would have she would have kept on that destructive path like she like if you got when you when you're when you get like at you like, I've never been a cheater, so I don't know that part. But I also know about, like, when I get manic. Like, I want to shop. I want to spend money. Like, mm. I kept noticing so many things. Like, like picking out so many things about her that that wouldn't have, yeah. It, so, even though she would have lived in the day's time, she would have probably even had a harder time because it would have been okay to, to divorce your husband and had... 15, 20 different men and, and sleep with whoever. It, but that's just, I, I just kept noticing that. That just kept sticking out in my mind. And I kept hearing the author kept saying, lust, lust. Like that, that was a, I don't know, that was a strong word to me. Lust is a strong word. So if she quit me. If she's lusting, like she's, I, I don't think that she could be fixed. Like her, she was going, she was, something bad was going to happen to her. I'm going to pause it. What kind of dog, what kind of little dog y'all got over there? S-H-I-T <laughs> eater? No. Uh, <laughs> ankle biter. I have a, a mini pen. A mini pen. And she's about. 15 she's she's very she's a bitch let's just like that. <laughs> blind Mom. deaf and stupid <laughs> <laughs> yeah building on your comment there um, like imagine like today where it's so easy to get credit cards things like that right you know god knows like especially with her husband as a doctor Lord knows, like, how much she would sink, like, in the debt and stuff now. Back he then. should have been noticing some, some kind of signs. If he was any kind of good doctor, like, he should have been re looking into her and noticing something is up. Hey, she pulled him in. She's like she's like one of them. If, if you've ever been around, like, I, I'm thinking it's like a, an identity disorder or something like that some some of them some of them um diagnoses and stuff 
the some of those pe like like they suck you they they suck you into it and then they like i don't know they it's like they suck the life out of you you know and and this is all why and they don't know there'll be one place to another bounce around be and one minute they're way up here and then the next minute oh my god i'm gonna kill myself and and that's like in the same sentence mm -hmm. so I, like, they either love you to, to the moon and back like oh i love you forever and always and then, then i'm gonna kill myself if you leave me yeah like you don't even have to leave like leave the room <laughs> but like i just i don't know i, I just keep I don't know. I just kept picking up on that. Like she has, she has some major things going. And I, that's why I said that earlier about him. He just thought he was just sucked into that. And I believe she had him, like you said, like manipulated. Um, the, the wolf was pulled over his, and, and he loved her and he was probably mesmerized by her. So the white of her fingernails or something, did you? Yeah. And and then it talked about him, his dirty fingernails and like I don't know nasty that, second teeth, <laughs> greasy or something. I thought, oh my, like this woman has him, like all she's got to do is be like this, like that's it, like and then he's whatever, whatever, honey, like yes, she, I'll do it. Like she right. she had him from day one with the whole finger sucking thing, right? Yes. <laughs> but you know if you think back to the very first part of the book when he went to check on her dad he may not have actually cheated on his wife mm -hmm. but he kept going back to see her over and over and over again so were they both just cheaters just right down when you get to it Right, that's cheating don't have to be a physical thing. Private conversations, anything is cheating. I mean, secret text messages, anything, it's all cheating. I mean, it's uh, whenever somebody looks at you and says, you know, well, uh, I didn't cheat on them. I was just talking to someone. So that's cheating. You don't, it don't have to be physical. If if you're if you're having secret conversations, the thought is in your head. Like why? For instance, okay. <laughs> this weekend, the girl I was gonna go see, she ended up okay. She stayed all night here Thursday night, the night of class. Because good God almighty, this is so awful. She called me because her because her boyfriend got arrested. <laughs> Don't start walking so, around. Is this your <laughs> is this your ex wife? No, it was the one that was in our wedding. Oh, <laughs> uh, that's it. But you're single now. You can do that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, like, it's just wrong because it was like the only friend in the way. That's just like you're just trying that you're you're trying to go low, low blows, like whatever. That's not no, do. absolutely not. That's not what this is about. This is a, <laughs> this is a good chance to relate Timmy's story to the book because uh, if you if you remember. Like when she has her kid, like she gets really ticked off because, well, she wants a boy more than anything. And then she has a girl, right? And she's very disappointed. But to uh, bring this back to Timmy's story, right? Um, you know, the reason why she wants a boy is she thinks that men have all the freedom to do whatever they want, whether it's have a you know, have a fling or have fun or do all these things, right? She, she, when she has a girl, right, she feels like that she's bringing someone into the world who's going to live an unsatisfied life just like she does because women aren't allowed to 
be, be held to those same standards. Um, I mean, even today, um, it's hard to argue that that's not true. So, um, you know, me, us men can go do whatever we want, not be judged that harshly, right? Whereas women are. Yeah, my divorce didn't go final Monday either. They pushed it back a month. I think I told y'all about that too, didn't I? No. No. No, we thought we thought it was already final. No. <laughs> Nope. What do you What do y'all think of uh, what I just said there? Like, do you, do you think that she was right about that? Or was it wrong of her not to love her daughter? Cause of that? I think that was very wrong. That's so. That is so. That, that's a huge double standard and it's still a thing today that men can literally go and do whatever they want and they can talk to you however they want and they can go sleep with whoever they want but the second the women do it we're awful right and it's not so much that men ain't judged as harshly it's that it's almost like they get a pat on the back for it so it's not, it is far, it's disgusting is what it did because it was, I I never done that. Like when my friends would go out on their uh, girlfriends or whatever, I wouldn't for it. I wouldn't let them do it in my presence. Absolutely not. It's not going to happen. Uh, but uh, I mean, I don't. I've been cheated on and I've cheated on people before. And I mean, it's just, it's, it's not a good feeling either way, honestly. But I mean, we all have laps of judgment at some point, some more than others. But I think it's unfair. I don't think, I think in my opinion, and it's just from a man's perspective, I think that men should be judged more harshly than women. Yeah, yeah, I mean, why that double standard isn't fair, to say the least. In, in all honesty, and this is just my opinion, I think that it's probably because the way that sex is that women, all of it's on the inside, if that makes sense. So it's almost like, I don't, I don't know. It's, I think it's because people think that women are necessarily, they're more attached to it too. Like it, there has to be more to it for a woman to do it. And that's not necessarily the case. And some women just don't care same way as some men don't i mean some people just don't need any connection whatsoever it's like oh well you know it's like changing pants more baby how do you do that for that's a good point like i i think it's it, it's personal it's it's to each person and and i'm sure back in that time that women were treated and judged more harshly and and it probably was it probably was crappy being a woman back then like so because I was getting ready to say no life is what you make it you know and and then I had I had her mental mental on top of it How, however it be, whatever was wrong with her like postpartum whatever was wrong with her like add that on to it and and then like her husband being disconnected and and like I I don't know I would say like but that's a good point Tammy and I, it was probably really hard living back then but I, I don't I don't know that I could like that's what I, what I was saying it's personal I personally couldn't just be like oh I don't want this baby and 
and whatever like I I just but I mean that is a that is a very true thing that women in postpartum like you do feel disconnected from this child and you don't want this child in your presence at that time because you you're dealing with some kind of chemical imbalance or and I think it's good that it was like that it was wasn't it what wasn't it taken like took away or, or sent somewhere else it's probably a good thing like because she might have done something really really bad to it like mm -hmm. I I was thankful for it mm -hmm. but I would I would say that women and then women back then were looked upon as baby makers like I like you 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 bore the children and cleaned the house like you didn't get to think oh I'm what oh I'm gonna be this when I grow up you know that's all you had to look forward to is uh as I gotta get me a good husband with some money and and has some, to have something and some stabi stability and plus that that instability goes back to where she grew up from the beginning like she has never like she never had that so she's unstable from the get-go See, and from that time, you know, back in those days, it, to me, she, it's almost like, just from my point of view, it's more accepting that women back then would cheat than they would nowadays, just because of the way they were treated. It's like, you're going to do something out of spite. They were treated like garbage. Like, absolutely. Like you said, you know, to stay at home, like, and it, you know, some women like to stay at home, but it's basically like, this is your life. This is what you are going to be Jackson. Uh, and, uh, like your life, whenever you're born, you come out as a female, your life's already made, made up. Yeah. You're at home. You're going to be nothing, but well, I ain't going to say you ain't going to be nothing, but it's like, okay, you're going to clean the house. Well, how does my husband want the house cleaned? How many kids does my husband want? What does my husband want for dinner? How does he want his clothes washed? How does he want them? I mean, and I don't, I don't agree with what she done, but at the same time with the way they were treating and looked up on and everything, I mean, she, can you really put completely at fault or is it more uh cult the culture I, it's, it's the same question we asked about medea we talked about medea right and did medea do the the bad thing she did to her kids we thought was part of this the society that she lived in the blame right? same question here with uh Madam Bovary that you raised, Timmy. Yeah. I because I was gonna say, just like what a hundred or so years before this, they killed you for cheating. They killed you for being promiscuous. And and then uh now you lost your you you lost your name, you lost your like you might as well have been exiled because you you wore the scarlet letter. So I it <laughs> You know what I mean? But I, I don't think <laughs> Madam Bovary, I don't think could help it. She was she was mm. gonna do do whatever. It's like every single one of these stories is the <laughs> same way with women. Yeah. And then you got Sistrada, which was the complete opposite of it's like you it, they they should have just put that as the last book of this section just for the women's revenge <laughs> to, to get back for what all these other women are going through like the way they've been i mean they're just straight up they're just flat out mistreated if anything and, it uh, makes you respect how far women have come like i i, I do i respect that like i, I respect women women's rights women's power like i like I, I believe in it and i respect it because it's not always been like that and and to a certain extent it's not now we're fighting we're still fighting in a man's world 
Yeah, to add to all this, like, Tony, you were talking about how women, like, back then did, like, all the chores and stuff. Well, in a way, it's even worse for Emma. I mean, because she's a more well-to-do woman. So, like, even the things like doing the laundry and cooking and stuff like that, she doesn't even do that. So, like, she has no intellectual. Luke. She has no activity at all. Or, no. like, Correct. That would drive anybody nuts. All she has time to do is sit around and read romance novels. Yeah, and it even said that it. I remember that part. It said the knitting set um, started but unfinished, and and it was little things like that that I was like, hey, you know, like that's that that's real. <laughs> Those are real disorder. That, that's that's real part of that disease. Like she definitely has mental illness. But yeah, she couldn't like she couldn't finish anything. But I also think that she was so wrapped up in those novels that she didn't want to finish anything. Mm -hmm. Those those fueled the fire like that. I wonder if she, if some of the cases of her cheating was just from boredom. Yeah, I think I think that's part it's of like, it. Well, here. you know, I live the same life. I do the same thing every day. Well, let's throw a <laughs> let's throw a curveball after the day. This is a good chance to segue over to talking about Emma's men. And, um. What does she find interesting about each one? I also want to talk about her relationship more with her daughter too. But let's let's talk about the men. Um, what's what's so interesting? Why did why is she so captivated by Leon, of the law student? Why is she so captivated by him? Do y'all think? His youth, maybe. Right, he's younger. He, mm -hmm. He's younger than her. Um, maybe, maybe she likes having that, um, like puppy love. Like she, that sort of puppy love. Like she feels validated by that. Maybe, like Nicole was saying a second ago. Uh, What if, what if, what if, what else? Why is she so captivated by Leon? Was he well well dressed or something? Mm -hmm. Well dressed and um, I, I forget. Something. What well he was well read. Well read. Yeah. I was going to say he talked to her about her books. He showed an interest in the reading, just like she liked. Mm -hmm. Right, so this this was a sort of intellectual stimulation she didn't get with her boring husband. And they would sit whenever her and her husband were at a part at another person's house. They would sit him and her and talk about their interests and things they have in common. While yeah, right in front of him, mm -hmm. I was like, what? Like get up, get up, say something to her. Like yeah. her head on his shoulder or yeah. chest, or I'm like, oh. <laughs> yeah. so, can you not see this going on? Well, let me lay my head on you. <laughs> right, they have their, they have this sort of like emotional thing in part two before he goes off to school. So um, like they have this like very like heartfelt goodbye like when he parts the first time. Uh, and then the actual physical cheating starts when they get to Rowan. Um, I don't know if you guys, I don't know if you guys caught this. 
just not true. Well, well, they live the in the woods. Passing, the passing they're, um, they're in the carriage together. The carriage just keeps driving around town, right? You can you can probably guess what was going on in the carriage, right? Well, Bobby doesn't spell it out for us, but, but he's not being that subtle either, right? The carrot that he keeps driving the car, he just rocking on the street. <laughs> so, uh, you know, that, that's when the physical stuff starts, right? When they get in the carriage and do it all day in the carriage, right? Well, and he's literally like his father died and. Like the whole reason is like he sends her away for that uh, guy to uh, draw up papers for her to get like the power over his uh, finances and everything. So <laughs> what a what a good time to decide to hey, you know it's like well okay my future's set so start working on that next man. <laughs> yeah, she starts. But I mean that's a. He, Sends yep. her away and pays for her a vacation, and basically paid for her to go on vacation to screw yeah. her life for three Get days. To pay her like I mean, like, dude, really? Where, um, where they go to Paris and stay at that? Whatever. I didn't really catch that much of it, but <clears throat> yeah, they go to the play or whatever. That's yeah, right. and it was just that that lifestyle she's never lived and and seen before. And then he moves her to this um, how did she put it? A country, um, nothing, nothing there, pretty much. And so she she just had to find her, I guess, something to occupy her mind. Well, she she wanted bigger, better, mm -hmm. every like she. Yeah, she lies and tells. Yeah, he like threw it. Like he just fed her to the like. Here you go, honey. You know. What is he? I don't know if it, he's just that. If he, if he's that dumb, or if he's just like I, I give up. Here you go. Mm. What? It, I mean, he would have probably. I mean, the way it seems, he'd probably bought the condoms for him if she'd asked. <laughs> yeah. And she she tells him she's getting music lessons once a week. Right? She has to go. Well, all yeah. The, she has to go all the way there to get her piano lessons or whatever. Right? Oh. Yeah, she's getting played on like a fiddle. <laughs> <laughs> But um, we find out that this puppy love that Leon has for her, right, that doesn't really last. Right? Once, once, the, once they start knowing more about each other than what books they like, right, that, and what goes on between the sheets, that's when the foundation crumbles. Right? He sees her as being very insecure and needy and things like that. Like she wants money. It draw she draws the line when she wants money from them, right? That, that's what that's what finally uh, ended it. Uh, she wanted money to pay for her debts to Laroe, and uh, <laughs> he's like, "See you later." Right? So that's that's where I draw the line here. She wants she actually wants him to rob his business partner, right, to get her the money. Right, so it's kind of hard not to blame Leon for uh, getting sick of her and wanting to dump her, right? Considering all of that, I'm surprised she didn't pull him in. Like, I'm surprised he he went after all this other crap that she's been able to pull out. I'm surprised. I seen a totally different ending. I did too. I seen her killing, poison. <laughs> yeah, because you. Because we got lots of foreshadowing about the poison. Yeah. So. Who y'all seen her poisoning Leon or Charles? 
Every one of them. Somebody. Everyone was going to say. Somebody was, was definitely, definitely Charles. <laughs> I think I heard something about even the even I thought even I was thinking maybe the um the lone shark where she was whatever whoever he yeah I I don't know where his she, name look Larue Larue yeah. Like somebody, I figured somebody was dying, but what's up about 12 lemons to clean her fingernail? Like, you remember that part? Did you? I, I can't. But whenever she started going. Right. Maybe this is the difference between Charles and Leon, right? Maybe Leon is more, I mean, maybe Leon is a bit smarter. Right. He can kind of see the tricks that she's trying to play on and it doesn't get manipulated by her. Right. Plus, he's a single guy living in the city, right? I mean, back when they were living in the country town, right, she was like the only thing to keep his mind occupied. Now that he's a single guy living in the city, right, he, he can – a lot more choices – of women and whatnot, right? So that probably played a part in it too. Uh, more intellect, more high society people to, even for him to talk about things like books and stuff with. So. The Rodolph, on the other hand, now this, this guy's a player, right? R Rodolph is a complete player. Right. He he never he never feels anything from her. Right? All he wants is sex. So uh, he he kind of he sees through her instant almost instantly. Like oh man, this woman does not like her, does not love her husband. I bet she'll be easy pickings. Right? And he just completely plays her uh, with love letter. He he writes love letters and. They go off on their horseback riding, and and then like he he just completely plays her easily. Um, you can kind of imagine he's almost like you can just kind of imagine like what he would look like, right? He's probably like tall, dark, and handsome, right? That's that's probably like no other country bumpkin in the town is quite like this guy. Um, Why'd y'all why'd y'all make of this character uh, of Rodolph? He's all, he's definitely a villain in the novel just because of how much he does manipulate her, but I don't know where you guys like go Rodolph, right? Or were you like what a jackass? Right? What, what was your guys? Impression of him. I'm pretty sure wasn't that the one that that I was talking about that that he like him when she he she walks out he sees her coming and he's like he's like oh yeah yeah like he even starts he's like, yeah yeah uh, like I was like man that's who I thought she asked money a player a, this guy's a player but yeah. She does ask him from him close to the end. Yeah. And he says, I don't have hmm. that kind of money. Yeah. I'm hurting myself. Like, yeah, I he, mean, dude, he, he was, yeah, I believe, I feel like he was too schooled and too, like, he went and it was fine as long as he was getting, getting what he wanted and there went, like, he, it didn't. You know, get what I'm saying? Nothing yeah, him. nothing from him. And then, yeah. Yeah. What's costing him a dime? But I do feel like they would have made it good together if they would have. What's costing him a two dime? Two peas in a pod. Yeah, he's pretty smooth. Like, the first time they go up on the balcony, like, during the festival or whatever, like, he's, like, rubbing his finger on her hand and stuff like that, right? So, He's a he's a pretty smooth customer. Yeah, he knows how to woo her. Like he had her, like like he had her feet up off the ground. Like he had her float. Like he baby love you. Yeah. Let me give you some love, baby. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, I feel like he's the only one that really understood her. Like he could, when he met her, he could immediately tell she was bored with her husband and uh, was ready for a love affair. Right, he's got that air of confidence about him too, right? He's the exact opposite of Leon in that regard. Like this is a guy who's confident, knows he can get almost any woman he wants. Right? He gets the thrill out of having someone cheat to be with him. Uh, yeah, a complete sleaze, right? That's that's pretty much what we have here. He's almost a fun character in a way, just because he is so such a complete sleaze. Like you're just kind of, in a way, like if you want to cynically read the book, you're just kind of like laughing along with him, right? Like, oh, let's look at him pray on this clueless woman, right? Like he he's he's got a charm about him. And then what does he do? He dumps her by text message. Right? He dumps her by text message, right? He sends, he sends, he sends the fruit basket with his love letter at the bottom of the fruit basket at, with his dump with his breakup letter. So uh, classic dumping by text message, right? That's that's what he does here. Old school. But really? but I feel like too, whenever she was when like when she's rejected, like she she kind of goes back to to uh, Charles, like and then like Keely made a good point. That's why she's like, oh, like because she's looking for her to poison him because like she was being nice. Like that's the only time in the book that you see them like. You know, she, you get what have, I'm his, have his dinner ready, have his cigar, have this for him, blah blah blah. But I think she, too, got that the baby. she thought maybe that he was gonna be famous. Wasn't that where the, the leg and stuff comes in? Like she thought he was gonna be famous too. So I think that had some to do with it too. But I also think that mixed with the rejection. She was like, Oh, honey. You know, we kind of get, this kind of goes back to what we talked about a couple of weeks ago with Tartuffe, right? She becomes like this religious zealot during this time, like right after Rodolph breaks up with her, right? She's she's suddenly acting all pious and Christian and stuff. Yeah. yeah so. That lasts all a long while, right? Till she, till she starts with Leon, so. <laughs> We can kind of see her guilt maybe manifesting in, in a way, right? Just because she is trying to, she's overcompensating for what she did. Yeah, she wants to throw herself out the window, right? When Rudolph sends the dump, the dump text message. Right, so. There was some preview. There was some foreshadowing of what was going to happen later. Right? <laughs> yeah, later in the book, we get this whole stuff with the money lender. Right, the money lender also preys on her. Right, he doesn't sleep. He doesn't sleep with her. He tries up close to the end, right? He's like, I'll waive some of your debt if you if you uh if you sleep with me, right? He tries, but he kind of sees what she's doing too. Like he sees her, he sees her as an easy opportunity to to get a uh, get to get the bank to foreclose on Charles's estate. So he he's a debtor, he's a debtor who is willingly lending money right just just cause and he knows that she can't pay it back just so she can he can sort of prey on her so uh, yeah we get that money lender character here credit to Flaubeau for not making this character Jewish right? because 
most most of the time in literature up to now, they would have made that character Jewish. So, so props to him for not doing that, right? But um, yeah, this guy, this guy's complete a complete sleaze ball too. He kind of sees through her. He's he's like Rodolph, except instead of seducing her, he's taking advantage of her financially. That's that's why I said earlier that I that I started to like feel empathy or sympathy for like these are these are sleaze bags and you do catch at parts where she is getting um taken advantage of. I was gonna say something else, but like no, she likes that. But uh, yeah, I just I, I just at times that I, I just felt like, I don't know, maybe it was me feeling like I, like, oh, I wouldn't want to come in, in, in the past with these people, but either, but I mean, I know she's manipulative and whatever, yeah. but like I said earlier, like, how she, it's easy to, to take advantage of mentally ill people, like it, and I, I feel I still feel like she had some type of mental illness, like, and she was all over the place. And she, like, so they were predators, and they they could sense that too that she would that she could be taken advantage of. Do you get what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. He constantly sells her stuff she doesn't need, like big Persian rugs and stuff like that. Yeah. And like you said, he's like he knows that she's not going to be able to pay for it. She's already in too deep and he just keeps on doing it. And and he so he knows what he's going to end up doing is foreclosing on everything. So I, I mean, I just I don't know. I just feel like that. It, that just wasn't right, and that, that it did. It, it made me feel bad. And, like, what, remember when you mentioned those credit cards in today's time? Like, that's Very just what they done. do today. And yeah. as soon as you start going to college, you get stacks of them this big. So, I mean, no wonder. No wonder. But, yeah, uh, there's, I don't know. Predators can, can feel that about people. Oh, this will be. This will be easy, you know, whether it's whether it's getting them in the sack, whether it's selling them stuff or whatever, like people and, and some people enjoy that, too. Yeah, God knows how much interest um, he's charging her, too. Um. He's, he's almost like a comic book villain, like rubbing on his hands, right? Every, every time she comes in a store, right? Ha, ha, ha. I wonder what she's going to buy today. And and no wonder she did what she did. Like, I mean, she, she was, she was not only, she had not only been, and, and yeah, she done it to herself, but still yet, like she was backed into a corner, like, that that was and she's already crazy like so this was the part of the book where i don't i started feeling less sympathy for charles because he actually gives her complete power over all of his money you know, he makes he makes her power of attorney um how could it like that's just that was just completely beyond the pale for me. Like yeah, asking for it. Yeah. But even if it would if if he she was gonna squander it all anyway, like it didn't matter if they were if who was alive and who wasn't and whatever, if if she was the last one standing, she was gonna because I feel like uh she she would have probably eventually killed him anyway, you know, if it wouldn't have been from stress. Like it, they were going to be homeless and cause she was in debt, whatever. But yeah, like he, and he was silly too. So. Yeah. 
Yeah, like there's some men who are like that, right? Like I can even speak for my own parents. My own parents are like this. Like my mom is completely irresponsible with money, but uh, my dad's too lazy to govern the finance, to look over the finances. So despite all that, she still, he gives her complete reign over the checkbook, even though... uh, even though she's not responsible at all, he even knows this. He still can't be bothered to have to pay the bills and stuff. So, yeah. And then cry about it whenever it's too late. And yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of like old traditional men who are like that, right? Who, who want the woman to do all that stuff you know, in a marriage. Not this guy, right? Yeah, when, when my dad <clears throat> retired, he said the only thing he knew how to do was pay the water bill. But uh, me and my wife done the same thing, but it was the other way around. She was she lost her bank card, or our four year old daughter lost her bank card a couple of years ago. I was I always kept the bank card. I was the one that went to the bank. I paid all the bills. I done this just to. I mean, that's one less stress on her, but then she left and said that I never gave her access to our bank. <laughs> it's like you can literally go through the drive through and get money anytime you want to, but I mean, that turned around to bite me, but uh, it's just, I, I don't want to say it's a control thing, but I know that if, like even now, if it's like, okay, well, we've got to get this done for the kids, I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll do it. Because if I'm the one doing it, I know it's going to get taken care of. Right. So, I mean, it's just, and the next person I get with would be the same way. I mean, it's. It's nothing, but I would rather just do it instead of asking the question of if it's got done. And it also takes stress off your partner, too, or should. So it actually takes stress off both of you. I'm kind of like you there in that way, Timmy. Like I I like to know these things myself that I did it. So I don't think I would, despite, I don't care how responsible the other person was, I I would still want to do it myself. That's just how I am. Exactly. And I mean, it's just... And I'm always been the one most likely out on the road. I was the one that traveled further to work. So just more convenient for me to take care of it. Well, that's what you all were saying. You're talking about it. And I've, I was thinking that's what in this time, that's what you did. You know, like now everybody has separate bank accounts and hyphenated names you know some some people don't even take their husband's name but in in these times especially and even probably i don't know 40 years ago it was like that you like your your husband had control and your uh and the and the bank like the bank accounts or what it and and stuff but also like if they and and if they get sick and this is even in today's times if they get sick the other person has you know uh what power of attorney or whatever and then the this was europe based i don't know how it how it was in europe but if you're if you're married and your your um husband dies then it would wouldn't it automatically transfer into the wife's pro- wife's it would become the wife's estate too so i mean that it's like sometimes sometimes if there were kids involved it would go to the son instead of the wife okay yeah there's no kids involved it would go to the wife so madame bovary wouldn't have got the money it'd been her son is that right well, no, she had a daughter. Daughter, daughter. Sorry. Yeah, I don't know where I got that from. 
but okay. But so would the daughter have gotten anything? No. No. Okay. No, the daughters did not inherit property. Just the male. Yes. Was that male. over here too in that time? Yeah, for the most part. Hmm. Good to know. I'm glad I live now. <laughs> Yeah, that, that kind of stuff didn't start changing until almost like the end of the 1800s going to the 1900s. Um, I, I would not I'm not exactly sure when. What American is this, like 17 something? Yeah, this was around the time of the French Revolution, so around the 1780s. 1780s. I knew it was close to 1800s, but. Yeah, we get a, we get a lot of like revolutionary type stuff in here too. Um, yeah, this is a, this is another point I want to talk about with the book going away from the cheating and the him or him and all this stuff is the actual like small town that these people live in. Um, this is this this is very much Flabeau being very cynical about maybe rural life, small town life, things like that. Like he, he's very tongue in cheek in this book with like how people are in these small towns. Like he, he constantly goes to the great lengths to describe like how people are gossiping about Emma being with like all these different men. But we have probably one, another one of the most despicable characters in the book is the pharmacist, uh, Huma, Huma, the, the pharmacist. Like he, the apothecary, like he's the apothecary. That's what they called pharmacists back then, was apothecaries. But this, this guy, like, he's completely... Uh, you can just kind of tell like he's almost like this scheming, sleazy, snake in the grass, politician type. Um, he's always giving the big speech. Whenever a big speech is getting ready to be given, he talks about art, but he doesn't, and literature and stuff, but he doesn't ever really know what he's talking about. Like, I don't know if you guys caught that, but like they even talked, he, they even like talked about the enlightenment in one part uh, like they're talking about Voltaire's plays and all this stuff um, so uh, yeah Homa especially is this sort of snake in the grass like he he starts this campaign near the end of the book because they want to kick the homeless guy out of town because he's a de degenerate and stuff like that too uh, like he kind of plants the seed for in a suicide because he even like tells her about like the arsenic, and what that does, and all that. So, yeah, the townspeople were painted as dumb and selfish and all this type of stuff. What I don't know, did you guys have any thoughts on that? How Flabeau's kind of painting rural life. In this book, is he is he satirizing the middle class? They called it the bourgeois in France, the middle class. All right, is he is he saying that middle class is all selfish and like we're just out to look for common, we're just out for material goods and material gains? And stuff like that. You guys think that's what he's doing here? Here, I see you nodding there, Nicole. You, you think that's what he's up to? I think I think so. Like I'm, I'm a catching that the way he paints. Um, and I mean, I, the way he paints. Um, is it Emma, the wife? Mm -hmm. I, I think so. Like, and and even and here even the what's his name is a doctor charles is a doctor and he don't make him he don't he don't make his character very very good so like i don't know if that's what you were getting at mm -hmm. if, is that what 
Yeah, I don't. He didn't. He didn't paint. He didn't paint them. There was really not a good character in this. It to what? How, if if you ask me. Yeah. Um, when. When Everybody you, had some type of flaw, like some some type of really major flaw. Yeah, even when uh, Leon gets sick of of Emma, uh, he even gives Mary, or even kind of gives a little description of that. Um, I'm looking at part three, chapter six. But it says, in the end, Leon had sworn not to see Emma again, and he reproached himself for not having kept his word, considering all that this woman might still draw down upon him in the way of trouble and talk, not to mention the jokes his fellow clerks traded around the stove every morning. Besides, he was about to be made head clerk. The time had come to be serious. And so he gave up the, fl the flute, exalted sentiments, and the fancies of the imagination. In the heat of his youth, every bourgeois had believed, if only for a day, for a minute, that he is capable of boundless passions, lofty enterprises. The most half-hearted libertine had dreamed of sultan's wives. Every notary carries within him the debris of a poet. So, although he even kind of insinuates here, right, Leon even kind of like dumps her, right, because Now's the time to be a serious middle class notary, right? That's pretty much what he is. He's a notary. Like he's better, like he's better than her. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I picked that up in a few a few few places. I couldn't tell you where it was, but yeah. Cause I had to look that bourgeois up. <laughs> Did you? Yeah. Yeah, any anytime you talk about like Marxism, Marxism and stuff like that, like that's what Karl Marx was writing about. Like he he wrote about like how the bourgeois is constantly being exploited by the upper classes. One day he argued like the bourgeois is going to get sick of the upper classes crap and take over. Like so that. That's where, like, his I that's where you get like ideas about socialism and communism and stuff like that. Marx thought that the capitalist system wouldn't always work. So eventually the middle class, the bourgeois, would rise up and overthrow the wealthy, the wealthy classes. So, yeah. So Mar Marx used that term a lot, bourgeois. I mean, I, I, that's all that's basically all it means, the middle class. Okay. People like all of us. Right? Yeah. And even like, and even in these times, like I felt like, I felt like a doctor and the apothecary, the, which is a pharmacist, I, I felt like they were doing a little better than most. Like mm -hmm. you were like, I don't even know if I would know they're not royalty and they're not, they're not, but I mean, I thought they were doing a little better than most, and they were still painted in a very bad light. Either, either dumb, can't handle their money, you know, or or, or they were a, a, a predator, a snake in the grass in some way. So I don't like. Yeah, he he gave. I didn't. I picked up on it, but I didn't know if it was like for the story purposes or to make it better, or if he was like really making you know giving them hell yeah the scene the scene where rodolph is working his charms on her at the at the fair or whatever right get this one politician getting up like talking about the the common man and all of this stuff right and yeah. that that was a very tongue-in-cheek like jab at the bourgeois there too okay yeah. Because like I uh, did notice those, like, like you were talking about them speeches and stuff, and I'm like, what? And they and they talk about the, I don't know, they talk about people like they're they're like downing people. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, they definitely are. Yeah, you you think to yourself as you read those passages, like these people are hypocrites. Yeah. 
right so yeah it's hard like I said it was really hard for me to pick where I was listening to it like I'm I'm way more visual than I am like so until you you'll like bring something up and it'll it'll strike a chord yeah I heard that but yeah like it's not like it's not like reading something it's because it feels like it's seared in my brain when I read it but listening to it it you you tend to lose things you know what I mean and, and you really don't know like you'll get a French lady reading something and it's like men passages or you'll get this man reading where it's like a woman and, and I'm like I, yeah it, it like like I said my head was doing like this but I, I finally got I finally got through it but I that's not the only thing I have going on in up here either so I tend to get lost and be very like <laughs> jump around, but yeah, he he did he he I, I I caught that like it's not he he wasn't being nice. I'll put it like that. Yeah, the book was heavily censored and even banned, and it wasn't because of the cheating things. It was because it made the middle class look so stupid, and yeah, it made them look so horribly. So like. You know, a lot of what the common French Frenchman didn't like this. So Bo actually had to go to court. For, like he was sued over this book because he was painting the middle class as being so uh, hypocritical. Boring and 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 it's like and like when she talks about them moving and talk like moving to the small town, like it, like you would have thought that they were moving to Chapmanville, West Virginia. You know what I mean? <laughs> or people, I, really, that's what I was thinking whenever I was, I was like, you know, and, and I noticed that those little things and like it was like it's making a big deal out of something. I'm like, what's why is that such a big deal? Now I know. So now I know. <laughs> <laughs> That reminds me of Southern's last dean. He moved here. He moved from California to Chapmanville, right? He, he always talked like despairingly about how that was such a step down for him. <laughs> well, I wouldn't say step. I mean, that that's yeah, that's like this book, but like yeah. maybe I would think culture shock, but yeah. uh, like I wouldn't yeah. say, oh, I stepped down to Chapmanville, West Virginia, but Fla Flabo <laughs> were. He didn't exactly say those words, but his tone meant those words. He let you know it. Yeah, I got you. Yeah, Will Wallerman and everybody else couldn't stand them. <laughs> I can party. see that. I can see that. Any other rest of y'all have a thought about the middle class here? I mean, he's he's making fun of people like all of us. I think so. Do you guys think rural life is this cynical? People were like this, selfish, out to look out for their own skins and whatnot. Somebody has a thought on this one. Well, I mean. I mean, we're all from small town America here, right? Like, I mean, rural France in the 1780s is a little different than rural America today. But it's hard not, it's, it's hard for me not to be like, yeah, he's right, right? Because I think he is right in a lot of ways. Like, you, you definitely see this sort of materialistic stuff happening, like, here in Wyoming County. Like, it's usually, like, the doctors or the lawyers' kids who everybody kisses their feet at school, right? They're usually the star athletes. Like, they worship the ground they walk on. They get good grades, right? Like, some kids, even in, like, the school systems here, right, are very favored compared to others, I've seen it when I was in school here. Right? I, I know how it is. Like, so it's it's hard for it's hard for me not to agree with Flabo. Right, that this is how small town life is in many ways.
it no. is but you don't have to come like it, you don't have to come out and you know make paint it like that you know you could yeah. there, there was other ways to that's just like you know the drug epidemic's horrible and, and we know it but do you have to have movies and documentaries made about it that make us look even even worse like that's sometimes I, <laughs> yeah, sometimes i'm like is that really necessary is that really helping you know like uh, i don't know that's that's just my personal like it, it makes it it makes me when I'm watching, it makes me feel horrible to be from West Virginia when we should feel good. And I'm very proud uh, of where I'm from and where, and that's, I want to stay here when I become, when I, when I uh, graduate and get my license and stuff I, that I want to stay here and I want to give back to my community. Um, do people yeah. have, in reality, do people have to leave because they can't make it on what <laughs> what they're paid and whatever but then that's a that's a true real fact just like like you were talking about but does it make it right no <laughs> but does it happen yeah <laughs> yeah i think you're right uh, i'm i'm in fact i'm teaching this class is the same way right i could teach anywhere right? but i choose to be here because this is where i'm from right so mm -hmm kind of like you in that regard yeah and i respect that and i respect people that do try to stay here and it is a it's it's a it's a fight you know so i mean i don't know yeah when i was a grad student up at wvu like they showed the oxiana documentary at the at the student center up there at wvu and uh, like they all like gathered together and talked about it after like the whole thing made my skin crawl because I'm yeah. from I, was, I was the only person from Wyoming County actually in the room yeah I was, like, I was like none of you people know what the hell you're talking about exactly and and yeah you know you're from there you 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 lived it those are your neighbors you know yeah. like I and I don't know like I I'm glad that things are getting, but some people still have no clue. And like I hear them put people down and I hear, I hear them, you know, it, I don't want those people in my town. I don't want to, I don't want to uh, like uh, talk about rehabs and stuff like that. And I look on Facebook and I'm like, honey, they're here, whether you want them here or not. I don't want them in my community. I'm like, they're, they're here. Yeah, like, let's get them some help. <laughs> Yeah, I know up in Parkersburg, uh, they had like a vote on it. Like, should should we allow any more of these like sober living houses to be in here? Like, the city voted no, I think. So. Oh, yeah, for for the reason you just said. Yeah, yeah, I know. We went through it here, right here in the little place that I live. Like, it's, but I, I think it's getting more. I want to say, I don't want to say, um, it, it, there's more education and more awareness that than there was, but like, I mean, it's, there's still a lot of stigma attached to it, but there, people are a little more educated and whatever. And I think it's also everybody around has had somebody in their family or, or ha has somebody in their family. So it's a little harder to say, I don't want those people in my community, you know? So but sorry, I didn't mean to go. I didn't mean to get up on my soapbox. I saw you unmute your mic there, Sherry. Did you want to say something? I was just going to say, we can either have them in our communities in recovery, or we can have them in our communities high as a Georgia pine, wondering what they're going to do to get their next fix. I don't know about y'all, but I'd rather have them in my community in recovery. That was that was my point to, to everybody around here. Thank yeah, you. People act self righteous. Well yeah, people act self righteous. They act morally superior. Uh, we see that in this book, right? This is how these people are acting about like Emma and what she's doing. They're probably all doing the same thing, right? So. Uh, 
that that's the gossip meal for you, right? We, we talked about how that works in churches and stuff a couple of weeks ago, part two. Now, before we conclude, we need to talk about the end. Um, what did y'all make of this end? Like, especially her suicide, right? She commits suicide at the end. Um, you, I mean, sure, like you, like Nicole said, right? She's got a mental illness, right? So, you know, she, it's hard not to sympathize with her in that regard. One of the interesting things about the ending, this is when real, this is where the realism thing comes in. Like, in stories before this, the character committed suicide at the end. Like, let's say Romeo and Juliet, right? If, if a character committed suicide at the end, usually they would just go to sleep and it would be painless and things like that. Well, Bo goes to the extreme lengths here to show how unpleasant the arsenic poison was. Like he talks about how it pretty much explodes her stomach, makes her sweat out, and all this stuff. Right? So he goes to very vivid detail chronicle her suicide, which was completely something unheard of and lit before this. Uh, he went out of his way to show how messy it was. Um, yeah, what did y'all what did y'all make of all, of all that at the end? I just thought it was sad that she felt like this was her only option. And you can see how desperate and hopeless that she felt and her just sinking into the despair of the mess that she had caused. And in the end, her mental illness did truly win out and she ended her life. Do you think, do you think that she had no other recourse, Sherry? That, that, or do you think she thought that? Or do you think she did have any other options? I think that she thought that that was her only option, that she was in this debt so deep and that there was no getting out of it. And she had probably destituted her and her husband. And so to her, I think that she felt like this is, this is my only option. Yeah. And I'm glad that he made it ugly, like just for like, I don't know how they reacted back then. I'm sure it didn't go uh, over well, but uh, there's been a lot of suicides that we've uh, we've heard about. Like you said, it wasn't at, like that, but I, I, I have a feeling the church played some role in that where he's where he made it ugly because it's it's a sin and and stuff like that. Do you, you think so? But I'm glad he I'm I'm glad he made it ugly. Like I'm glad it wasn't. Oh, she laid down and went to sleep. And plus it's kind of like um uh, I don't know. I feel like it was like that was how all of her sins were coming out at once. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Like she was making an atonement for all that yes, she had done. Yes, yes, yes. Like that's that's really how I feel about it. Or how, and, yeah, how it was meant to be. And how most uh, writers portray suicide is, like you said, it's just clean and um, it's easy, except for Medea's victims. And they kind of <laughs> died a horrific death as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, you know, most of them, though, it is that, well, they just took the poison and they laid down and die. Romeo and Juliet, for instance, look how easy and yeah. peaceful that she went, you know. Yeah. What about all the foam and the, and the, oh, and the, you like your, they don't, yeah. don't your ribs break from all the conv convulsions and, and stuff? Like, come on now. <laughs> like, so I'm, I'm glad that it was. It was more real, too. And I don't think suicide should be pretty. and It shouldn't be easy. It should show you what it's really going to look like if you decide to take that route. 
Yeah, this goes back to the very first thing we read in this class, which was the death of, so of Socrates, right? Um, like Socrates died by hemlock poisoning, right? Which was, if, if you're going to get poisoned, I guess that's the way to go because it just makes your body completely numb and then you do fall asleep, right? But like this idea of suicide is it weirdly, even though it's the most, the worst thing you can do as a Christian, in the Western world, um, it's always been almost glorified in a way. You know, like um, a character like her who no longer has any dignity, right? Like, so the idea here is rather than sleep with like a money lender or something to give her more money, right? The option is she can keep her dignity by offing herself. Right. That's that's how the Western world viewed suicide for a long time. Like if you're let's say you're a disgraced politician or uh, you're like you're somebody now who like might have got canceled right? in cancel culture. Right? The, the prevailing view for. Since the Romans, the Romans are the ones who came up with this. Right. If you lose your dignity, what else do you got left in life? You might as well just lead the world on your own whim. So there's, there's always been the stoic view of suicide versus the Christian view. I always think about Cleopatra and that snake. I'm like, there ain't no way. <laughs> and then they always like make it so beautiful in literature and books. And I'm like, there's nothing pretty about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she let a snake, she let like a king cobra bite her, right? So mm -hmm. it might, might have been that or a black mama. It was one of the two. And some type of asp is what I've heard. Yeah. I think that's a like a in the mamba fan, like something like in the one of them two families. But yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, like you even see stuff like that in like monster movies. Like I taught the Godfather one and two in my movie class a couple of weeks ago. Like even at the end of that, like you had a disgraced mobster who killed himself at the end, right? He'd slit his wrists in the bathtub, right? That's that's the same view of suicide. That and they always make that pretty too. Like, you know, I'm like, whatever. But yeah, yeah, I think I think suicide's glorified too much in movies and, and literature and yeah, I weirdly enough know a lot about this subject. I was in grad school. I took an entire class called Literature and Suicide, right? Where that's all we did all semester was read stories about how somebody off themselves. I mean, that was the most bizarre class I ever had to take in my life. It would be fun. Like, I mean, like, <laughs> like if you're, if you're um, mentally there to take it. But I just, I just think about like, you know, kids watching, watching stuff and, and things like I just, I do. I think it's, I, I don't know. It's like that. It's always back and forth about it. But then. But it sounds like a cool class. I would probably take it. Yeah, we read, we actually read Paradise Lost in that class because of uh, like the speech at the end where Adam's like, we might as well just off ourselves. Right. Remember, remember that passage in book 10. We read Frankenstein because Frankenstein's monster at the end kills himself. Yeah, so we read all kinds of uh, stuff. We should have read this. We didn't, though. Yeah, that was that. Te that was what that teacher did her dissertation on, which was I can't even imagine like writing about that for like a book project. I can't even imagine doing all that research about it. That's kind of oh, more I couldn't <laughs> either. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> never be the same. <laughs> Yeah.
Well, guys, this looks, this looks good. It seems like, let me make sure I can get everybody who's here. But this was a pretty good, I think you guys all got into this book. It was, it's a good read. Um, if you want something similar, like a similar flavor of book, I would recommend you check out a book called The Awakening by Kate Chopin. Um, that's that was a book written in the 1890s, but um, very similar story to this. It's it's almost like the Awakening is pretty much like the American version of this story, you know, in many ways. So, like, if you if you're interested in all these issues we've been talking about, with, and there's infidelity and stuff in that book too. It's very similar to this. So I would, if you if you like the, if you like this one, I would recommend you check that book out. And that's a classic American one. Um, when is our last paper due? Let me double check that real quick. It's after break. I do know that. Okay. Yeah, I think it's the Friday after break. I think that's what I read. Uh, yeah, can I um, care to stay after class for a second? I need to ask you one question. Of course. As, I mean, it might turn into about 30, 45 minutes. <laughs> how it usually does. We, we had a good time after class last week, if I recall. Yeah. Yeah, we did, didn't we? <laughs> I mean, half up but my jacked up life. <laughs> <laughs> you, you have definitely brought a lot of entertainment to the class. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I try my best. <laughs> So the, pa the paper is due Tuesday the 30th. Tuesday the 30th after break. Okay. I'm asking for it then just because at this time period I'm going to need all the time I can get to grade all this stuff. All right, so um, the Tuesday after break. If you've done the first two, you don't have to worry about it. Okay. And remember... When you get your second papers back next week, remember you can do a revision on that too. So, like if you let's say you get a B on it or something, you want to revise for an A, I would say it would be easier to revise for an A than do the third paper, right? So, you all you all will have to weigh the your choice to yourself. I think eighteen. Yeah, 18 people in the class did short paper two. That's less than half of the class. So um, a good many of you will have to do short paper three. Remember, the questions are up on Blackboard. They're about Paradise Lost and Madame Movie. That's what I let, that's what all the questions that I gave you were on. So you can take your pick of uh, whichever book you gravitated to more i guess you can take your pick of those questions the same process as before write a good thesis statement that details your reasons up front that's where a lot of people went wrong on that first paper like a lot of you all uh, weren't quite clear what your argument was right at the beginning and as a result, a lot of people spent time summarizing the story instead of analyzing the story. You always got to, those questions I give you are all argumentative. So make your argument right up front and prove your argument using the text. You always got to use the text to give some quotes and evidence from the text. So just remember to do that too. Oh, can, I, can I say something? Like, whenever I write these papers in that first paragraph, I always put, like, well, I've done that on Hector. I cannot remember what my three points were, which, I mean, I, I scored really good on it. I always put what my three main paragraphs, the main uh, purpose of those paragraphs in 
in that first i mean just yeah. that alone and talking around those points basically gets you directly through your first paragraph with ease and i mean you're talking at least 150 words to 200 words so i mean you're already i mean it uh, i mean i did good on it so i mean it's just a a point that i wanted to let everybody know i mean it's just it really and it gets your point across like in that first paragraph you're talking about what the whole paper is about right there right that's a very other, conclusion yeah i can't you're exactly right tammy i can't stress that enough it's very important to do list your three or four reasons up front then in your body of your paper prove those three or four reasons Assume your reader knows the story. Assume your reader knows the story. So you don't have to explain what happens in the story. Assume your reader knows the story. Because I do, obviously. So yeah, like I said, I'll be catching up on all this stuff over break. The break will be a merciful time for me. Like during the weekdays, I don't get all a lot of time to grade just because I spend so much time reading and lesson planning and all that stuff. But that's why I get so far behind. But next week, I'll have time to do nothing but that. So you guys will get a lot of stuff back all at once. And I'll allow a little revision on short paper two and a revision on the poll if you for some reason or other, those don't work out for you. Okay. And then the, our very last Zoom, let me take a quick peek at what we're going to be talking about. I, I actually don't remember right off the top of my head. What did I have now? I'm actually going to I'm actually going to change the syllabus up for the last week. I think um, I have a, I had a whole lot of stuff written down there. Um, yeah, that's we're already we're all going to be busy enough our last week anyway. Um, I'm going to have you read. What, what can I, I can have you read almost anything? What should I have you read? I'm going to have you guys read a, a little story, a little piece of American wit. I'm going to have you guys read a story called Bartleby the Scrivener. Bartleby the Scrivener. Uh, that'll be, that's that's a about a 20 page long story or so. I think, I think that'll be enough for the last week. Because during the last week, I will also be reviewing for the final exam. So for about 30, 40 minutes, we'll talk about that story, and then we'll review from the final exam. Okay. So I'll send this out as an announcement to everybody. But what's listed on the syllabus? What was the What was the name of it? The name I'll I'll post the story on Blackboard for you to read. But the name of it's Bartleby the Scrivener. Yeah, Bartleby the Scrivener. Yeah. So, so the final exam is it like a test or is it a paper two or nope it'll, it will be a test and i will be going over that during our last zoom i'll pretty much review the whole test like i'm going to write the test during break too usually uh, during those review sessions i pretty much give away the answers <laughs> That's usually what I do. Didn't you say our final was going to be multiple choice? Or was we going to – didn't you give us an option of multiple choice or to write a paper way that for it, the final? The way that it works, there's 30 points of it as multiple choice questions and 70 points on it is short answer questions. So, like, I'll give you a passage from one of these books so like you'll have to kind of like identify the author, where the passage came from, then like what's the 
what's the themes going on in the passage, stuff like that. If you kept up with the reading, you'll you will do well on it, which I know you've done, Timmy. Usually, my final exams and lit classes they have a wide disparity. I'll have a lot of A's, a couple of B's, maybe a couple of C's, usually a lot of F's. Right? There's always a lot of A's and a lot of F's. What does that tell me? Some people have read the stuff. The people who've read the stuff got A's. People that didn't read the stuff got F's. Right? So if you kept up, you attend the review session, all that stuff, you guys will undoubtedly do well. And I did that too because my final week's going to be bad enough anyway, grading 101 papers. So that's what that's another reason why I give a test, just because if I had to read any more papers that week, I might burst. So uh, tests are easier to grade. So is is it going to be timed our final exam? Yeah, I'll probably give you like two hours to do it. Um, you don't have to like come to class to do it or whatever. You can sit down whenever you have a quiet moment at your house and do it whenever. So, um, but it will time you though, like after two hours, it'll time you out. So, um, make sure whenever you do take it, it's two hours when you have ample time where you won't be distracted. But yeah, you'll take that during finals week. You is, said you was giving back our grades and, uh, over Thanksgiving break for our papers. We did uh, yeah. what, our sonnets. Your sonnet and your short paper, too, if you did one. Right. I'll be getting back over break. Okay. I, have, I have them all printed out right here. Right? Here they are. <laughs> I've actually adapted a new system for grading too. Um, for, like I'll grade the paper with a pen, but then I'll type up your end note with, I'll actually type that because I can type faster than I can write. So I'll grade the paper with a pen, but then I'll give you your grade and your end note with type. That's how I've been doing it lately, so. My handwriting is so bad. Right, that that's doing you a mercy as well. Did any of you guys have trouble reading my writing when you read that first paper? Were you like, what the hell did he write there? I I didn't I didn't there wasn't like a lot of markings on it or anything. But uh no it, it wasn't it wasn't too bad. Just Typical signature, I guess. <laughs> they say they say that really bright people have a bad handwriting, right? So I'll I'll buy into that theory. I mean, I'll buy into it because it's I have I have some of the worst handwriting ever. So. I had a professor once that told me my handwriting was the worst he had ever seen in his career, right? So. That, that's who your teacher is. But you got a doctor, so I mean, you you got you can one up them with that. Yeah. <laughs> I bet you anything I've seen worse handwriting than you. You think than yours? So? Absolutely. I had a lady at Crossroads, and I'm telling you, her fella. He had multiple personality disorder. I'm certain of it. Um, he started out, his handwriting was really nice, really neat. And the more that it went through, he would even change the color of ink. And it would get smaller and smaller. And there was misspellings in it. The strangest thing I ever saw in my life. <laughs> Yeah, I hold a pencil a weird way too. 
So like, um, that's always perplexed people. Like I hold a pencil, I hold a pen and a pencil in a weird way. Like ever since I was a little kid. So uh, that, is, that probably has something to do with my bad, bad handwriting as well. Yeah, you'll get the, you'll probably get the short paper sent back to you, graded on pen and paper and scanned. I'll probably send your poems back just straight off from the computer, though, because they're, those are really easy to grade. So I'll send those back as a Word document to you. Yeah, yeah, I will get called up. <laughs> Last week of class, you'll know where you stand. If anybody who doesn't do the Zooms watches this session, same goes for everybody in the class who's not been joining us on Zoom one semester. Some of those folks are doing real well. Like they, a lot of people are writing on really intelligent discussion boards and stuff. So I've actually been really pleased with even our non Zoomers. Uh, they've been most of them have been doing their thing, so. But we had a lot more fun, right? <laughs> Abs absolutely. You said we only got one more class left. Yeah, unfortunately. I'm going to be sad. That's, that is that is so upsetting. <laughs> like you, we all have to you take know, that. Uh, usually, I class just next time. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I usually just wear a mask all week long and save all my talking for Thursdays. So I don't know what I'm going to do. <laughs> yeah, you all will just have to join me next semester for one of my classes, right? So some of you, I know Kashina and Sherry, you're both taking film. Yeah. Lord, I don't even want to look forward and look to that. I'm already crazy. I can't imagine how crazy I'm going to be in the masters and doing papers and doing doing this class, a class like this too. So, Lord, is, or is anybody having any problems with like with it freezing up? Is it just on my end? No. Like, I mean, I'm okay. So, whenever class ends, if, you, if I don't answer for a seat, just give me a second because it's like taking five to 10 seconds. Sometimes I'm freezing up. But yeah, next semester, I've only got <clears throat> nine hours as far as I know scheduled. So, I'm going to take one of your classes because I've got to be a full time student to get my uh, thing. I, I 